Now, if you missed last Sunday, let me, let me just kind of share with you what this, is, what this is about. We're talking about how to live a life that really matters by getting the most out of life, by living life not according to our ways, but according to God's ways, because God really does know best about how to live life. There's a classic story that I'm sure most, if not all of you have heard, that really does tee up an important concept related to this topic. It's a story about a manufacturing plant. And in this manufacturing plant, there were many machines, but there was one enormous machine, piece of machinery right in the middle of the plant. One day, that piece of machinery on which everything else depended came to a screeching halt. So productivity, the production of the facility completely shut down. Well, obviously, the engineers and the foremen and the managers were all desperate to try to find out what was wrong so they could get the factory back online. Well, after an entire day of lost productivity, they were desperate. So one of the foremen uh, said, you know what? I know the engineer many years ago who designed this facility and who oversaw the installation of all of this equipment. Why don't we give him a call to see if he can help? So they did so. A couple hours later that evening, uh, this old engineer comes walking into the facility. He walks to the middle of the plant to this enormous piece of machinery, looks it over for just a few seconds. Then he reaches down into his bag and takes out a small hammer. And he walks over to the piece of machinery and taps it. And as soon as he did so, the entire factory sprung back to life. So the managers and the foremen, they were so ecstatic about this man's help. And he said, he said, look, you send us a bill and we'll pay you whatever you want us to pay you. So the next morning, the manager of the plant gets an email from the old engineer. And it says, an email that said, balance due for services rendered, $10,000. The manager was thankful for his help, but he thought that was a bit extravagant for about five minutes of work. So he very kindly responded to the old engineer, could you please send me an itemized copy of your bill? Within two minutes, the old engineer responded, tapping with a hammer, $2. Knowing where to tap, $998,998. Okay, what, what's the point? When it comes to knowing how something works, the knowledge that the creator and designer has is invaluable. When it comes to doing life well, the designer's know-how is priceless. And God gives to us in the Bible his ways to live life well. We're examining what that looks like by looking at a man named Abraham out of the, in the uh, Old Testament. In fact, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 12. There's many things, there are many things that we could say about Abraham, but we could all say this. Abraham lived an extraordinary life. God really did make this man a great man. He made this man the father of a great nation. So as you and I consider, how can I live my life to its fullest? We are learning by example, by watching the life of Abraham. Now, last week, I shared with you, we started Abraham's journey with God when he, I explained how when he was living in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans, God appeared to him and said, Abraham, I want you to leave your homeland, leave everything familiar to you and go to a place I'm going to show you. Didn't tell him where. We now know he was leading him to a place called Canaan. Abraham didn't know that. So Abraham left Ur and I talked to you last week about how he got to a place called Haran and he stopped there. And he settled there, and we talked all about that last week. Today, we're going to watch Abraham finally arrive in the land of promise. 
Abraham is finally going to arrive in the place that God wanted him to be, a place called Canaan. If you have your Bibles, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Genesis chapter uh, 12, starting with verse 5. He, Abraham, took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Moray at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So Abraham built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now let's stop right there. Folks, this is a beautiful picture. This is a picture of a beautiful communion between Abraham and God. Abraham finally arrived to the place God was leading him. And for the first time since before he left Ur of the Chaldeans, God appeared to Abraham. God spoke with Abraham. God reaffirmed his promises that he had made to this man. And in response, Abraham built an altar to God and worshiped God. We see a beautiful picture of intimacy between Abraham and God in the place of promise. Which brings me to an important takeaway in this scene. Intimacy with God is found at the center of his will. When church, listen, when you choose God's ways, God's ways will lead you to a place of intimacy with God. Because at the end of the day, that's what God wants. God created you to have an intimate relationship and fellowship with you. God's ways for your life, it should not be surprising, God's ways for your life lead you to that place of intimacy. When we are where God wants us to be, we enjoy intimacy with him. But not only is that what God wants, here's what I want you to hear me say. That's what we should want as well. Now, why do I say that? Because intimacy with God, turns out, is in fact life's greatest pursuit. If you pursue after God, if you follow His ways into intimacy with Him, you will find all your heart is looking for. So many times I see people wasting life because they're pursuing things, like they're, they're pursuing after peace in all these different places. They're searching after significance or purpose or longing, uh, belonging. They're searching for all of these things and they never find a sufficient source for any of it. But when we pursue after God, not only do we find Him, we find this ultimate source of all that our hearts long for. How many of you remember the story of Jack and the Beanstalk? Do y'all remember this? Jack and the Beanstalk? Okay. If you know Jack, the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, raise your hand. Okay. A lot more than was in the first crowd. <laughs> must, must be a generational thing. I don't know. Okay, if you happen not to be familiar with, or if you happen not to remember the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, it's about this little boy named Jack who is basically a criminal, okay? Because this little boy named Jack climbs up and down this giant beanstalk to rob the giant who lives in a castle at the top of the beanstalk. Y'all remember this? I mean, he's nothing but a thief. So... On one of his journeys up this beanstalk, he is uh, trying to find, okay, what am I going to steal now? He has this overwhelming, you know, passion to steal things. So he arrives and he sees something he can't believe. He literally watches a hen lay an egg, but it's just not just any egg. It is a what? A golden egg. 
Jack sees this hen lay a golden egg, so he wants it. So he begins to think to himself, okay, how can I get that and get out of here? And he realizes he has to make a quick escape. He doesn't have time to steal both the hen and the egg, so he has to make a decision. What does Jack do? He steals the hen that lays the golden eggs. If he steals the egg, he gets one egg. If he steals the hen, he gets a source of many eggs. You say, Pastor Jeff, what on earth does the story of Jack and the Beanstalk have to do with what we learn in the life of Abraham? Here it is. When we do life our way, when we do life according to our ways, we tend to pursue blessings. When we do life God's way, we pursue the blesser. When we live life according to God's ways, God takes us into a place of intimacy with him so that we can enjoy the ultimate source of all that our hearts long for. Pursuing intimacy with God is in fact life's greatest goal. Intimacy with God is life's greatest pursuit. That's why Jesus said this, you know this, don't worry, he says, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? In other words, Jesus says, don't worry about pursuing blessings for pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And when you pursue his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be given to you as well. When we pursue after God, we not only find him, we find all that our hearts long for. Abraham finally arrives at the place of God's will and he enjoys intimacy with God and then something unexpected happens. Let's continue the story, verse 10. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Now, there was a famine in the land of Canaan. Now, let's stop there because this is very significant. Can, you, can, we, can I just remind you of what's going on here? Abraham has arrived in the land of promise. Abraham is finally exactly where God wants him to be. And the first thing he experiences, while, one of the first thing he experiences while he's there is a famine, a challenge, a danger. So in God's tended, intended place for Abraham, he experiences something he's never experienced before. He didn't experience famine in Ur or Haran. They're on the Fertile Crescent. But when he gets to God's promised place, he experiences this great challenge, which brings me to another key takeaway from the life of Abraham. And here it is. Faith is built through testing. Faith is built through testing. Even when, Christian, listen, even when you are right smack dab in the middle of God's will, God will continue to build your faith through testing. Abraham was where he, God wanted him to be, and yet he experienced. Now, why does God test us? God does not test you to see what you're going to do because God already knows what you're going to do. God tests us so that we will understand what we're going to do. It helps us understand where we are so that our faith can be built stronger than it previously was. Now, I just want to mention something as an aside here. This right here is exactly why you should never assume that someone who is going through a bad time is outside of God's will. Now, sometimes that happens. Listen, sometimes we get into a mess because we make lousy decisions. Sometimes we get into a mess because God is chastising us for being outside of his will. But that is not always the case. Abraham was right where God wanted him to be. And in, that, in the center of God's will, God brought a test. So God allows Abraham to be tested by a famine. Now watch how Abraham responds to this test. Let's finish verse 10. 
Now, there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was so severe. Okay? Abraham had just experienced beautiful intimacy with God, having arrived in the center of God's will. And then a test came. And instead of trusting God and staying where God wanted him to be, Abraham decided, it's time to take matters into my own hands. And Abraham left the promised land and went down into Egypt. He did not ask God if that's what he wanted him to do. God did not tell him what, if that's what, that's what he wanted him to do. And while Abraham was in Egypt, no intimacy with God, no altars of worship built, Abraham left the center of God's will. Now, before I go on to this next takeaway, I do want to just clarify something. You and I are to do all that we know to do. Let me say that a different way. Faith in God is never to be an excuse for carelessness or irresponsibility. Pastor Jeff, do you believe that God is sovereign and that God can take care of you? Yes, I believe that with all of my heart. But I still wear a seatbelt. Now, why do I do that? Because we are to do all that we know to do. God gave us a brain to use our brain. Abraham here did not get into a mess because he did all he knew to do. Abraham got into a mess because he left the place of God's will and struck out according to his own ways instead of God's ways. Abraham left God's preferred place. And here's the takeaway. The path from God's will, when we leave God's will, the path from God's will is always downhill. The Bible says Abram went down into Egypt. And when Abram went down into Egypt, leaving the place of God's perfect will, he stepped out on a slippery slope of spiritual and moral failure with serious and long-lasting consequences. Let's just follow the story. Verse 11. As Abraham was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know that what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. So Abraham comes up with this plan. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Now notice, when Abraham stepped out of God's intended place for him, his, he went from trusting God to making up his own schemes. You notice that? Apparently, Sarah was a very attractive woman. And Abraham says, look, uh, Sarah, before we get down here to Egypt, we need to understand, I need you to understand something. What Pharaoh wants, Pharaoh gets. So if he wants you to be his wife and he knows that I'm married to you, it would be nothing for Pharaoh to just take me out of the equation. So I have a better idea. Instead of telling people you're my wife, let's tell them that you're my wife sister, because as your brother, I will be your guardian. So if Pharaoh wants to marry you, he'll have to come to me for the marriage arrangements and whatnot. Now, let me just point something important out here. When Abraham told Sarah, tell them you're my sister, he wasn't lying. He wasn't lying. He wasn't suggesting they lie. Because if you just fast forward the story a little bit to Genesis chapter 20, verse 12, Abraham says, Sarah really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother. And she became my wife. You see, Abraham and Sarah were half brother and sister. 
Abraham was a brother from a different mother. They were, they were half brother and sister. So he wasn't lying, but he did deceive. That's important. Christian, listen, you don't have to lie to bear false witness. The sin is not just in lying. The sin is in deceive, intentionally deceiving someone. So Abraham sinned here, not by lying, but by merely being deceptive. Now at first, as sin often does, it, this really appears to pay off. What a great idea this turned out to be because look at verse 15. When, the, when Pharaoh's officials saw Sarah, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. Pharaoh treated Abraham well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. Everything appeared to be going great. It looked like Abraham's sin was paying off. Here's the problem with sin. A sovereign, all-knowing, and just God always judges sin. Verse 17, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. You see, in this place of Abraham's own making, when he stepped out of God's will, blessing was replaced by judgment. There might be some here this morning and you think to yourself, I've gotten away with this. Nobody knows what I've done. There might even be some in here that would say, you know, this secret sin has really paid dividends for me. Not only have I gotten away with it, but I have benefited from it. Okay, let me remind you, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Sin is never something we get away with because the problem with sin is that God always judges it. So Abraham is kicked out of Egypt to return to a famine-stricken promised land. But tragically, Abraham's departure and escape from Egypt would have long-term consequences that were devastating. If you have your Bibles, turn just a few pages over to Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. While in Egypt, Abraham and Sarah acquired an Egyptian slave girl. This Egyptian slave girl left Egypt with Abraham and Sarah when they were kicked out. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Now, if you're a student of the Old Testament, you know that this Egyptian slave named Hagar is the mother of a son named Ishmael. And if you're a student of the Old Testament, or if you pay attention to current events in the world today, you know that Ishmael's birth not only caused Abraham great heartache and great grief, but still impacts our world today. When Abraham stepped out of God's will, destructive consequences of that decision endured. 
Abraham returned to the promised land. And in fact, once he got back there, he enjoyed intimacy with God again. But sin always leaves scars. Can God forgive you? Yes, he, he wants to forgive you. Can God make you whole? Yes, God can make you whole. But the consequences of our sin oftentimes endure, often to keep us from making the same mistake twice. Abraham left the center of God's will, struck out according to his own ways, and the consequences were devastating. You see, church, God's ways really are better than our ways. God's ways always lead us to intimacy with the ultimate source of all that our hearts long for. And we walk away from God's ways to our own demise. As I described last week, this journey with God for all of us has exactly the same entry point, the same on-ramp. You want to do life according to God's ways? Your journey with God begins in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus is the only one able and willing to bear your sins and mine on his shoulders Die in our place, paying the penalty for our sin that we owe in a way that will satisfy God's wrath toward our sin. Your journey with God has an own ramp. And his name is Jesus, the one who died in your place. If you have not yet began, begun your journey with God by placing your faith in what Jesus did for you, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer that you have to pray out of your heart sincerely to your creator. But the Bible says that anyone who cries out this way to the creator, God will cleanse you of your sin and will have a relationship with you. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. This is a, this is a private moment, a personal moment. If you'd like to confess your faith in Jesus, your heartfelt prayer might sound something like this one. Dear God, I know I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus, your son, died in my place and then he rose from the dead. And I'm placing all of my hope in what Jesus did for me to pay for my sin, to cleanse me of my sin so that I can live in intimate relationship with you. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone looking back up here, if that was your heartfelt prayer this morning, I would love to be able to help you understand more fully what it means to place your faith in what Jesus did for you. One of the ways that we do that is to offer you literature. You have to pick it up voluntarily. It's back at guest services on your way out, but it's there for you. If you prayed along with me, please go by and receive a copy of it from us. It'll be helpful to you. If you're watching online, we would love to mail this same literature directly to your home. If, uh, if you prayed along with me this morning, simply go to imadeadecision.com. imadeadecision.com. It'll take you to a form, very simple form. Fill it out, send it to us. And we'll put literature in the mail to your home this week. Thank you for watching this video on First Redeemer's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, click like below and leave us a comment. And if you'd like more content like this, click subscribe and turn on your notifications. Thanks again for watching.